As an object of study, uh, we think of world literature as texts and traditions that have an active life beyond their origins and that cross linguistic, national, cultural, and regional borders. Um, in terms of our contemporary uh, moment of world literature, um, world literature is seen less as a global canon of texts or even all literatures of the world, but rather as a field, a literary and cultural field that takes the measure of the importance of literary production, consumption, publication in our global era. Uh, that is broadly how we define the field. But in terms of, uh, you know, it's also a conceptual apparatus. Um, so, so how do we do it then? Because the literatures of the world are so Past. How do we do it? So the focus there is on trans-regional comparative frames. So we, we may compare literatures from, say, one region of the world with another region of the world. So we could have a rubric like Atlantic uh, literatures across the Atlantic. So we compare um, literatures from produced from Spain and Portugal with Francophone and Lusophone literatures from Latin America and produce a whole trans-regional rubric. So the comparative frame becomes very important. Uh, translational, um, uh, it's always a translational enterprise. And we, um, uh, without, without translation, without a, world, a, work, a, piece, a, lit a literary work can only have currency in another part of the world through translation. So we look at the uh, influence of these large uh, linguistic enclaves, global world languages. Currently, it's English, Spanish, French. In previous eras, there have been other global languages, other languages that have had an impact beyond their specific region. So if you think of Arabic, you think of Sanskrit, you think of Persian. So it's a way for us to actually think of the field in terms of interconnectivity uh, beyond the nation, beyond local uh, literary cultures beyond very specific area related works and trace connections between multiple literary cultures. The first uh, thing that I'd like to emphasize is the long durée historical approach to thinking world literature. Many of the theories of world literature that have emerged in the 21st century are, are fairly oriented to uh, the contemporary, the modern, modern and contemporary world, transformations uh, in, in culture, societies, technologies, histories, um, from the late 19th century until the 21st century. So in these volumes actually um, go back to um, thinking, registering the fact that global literary traditions, thinking world literature, has a long pre-modern history. Uh, and, and so for instance, we, uh, so we, 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 we begin from uh, a, a section on genealogies that actually goes back to the Hellenistic Mediterranean world, uh, uh, almost like a proto-world uh, literature moment, where there were these range of literary exchanges across Greek, Roman, Egyptian, it's kind of a Greek, Roman, Egyptian syncreticism, as, as one of the authors puts it. Then, then we track, another example I'll give you is a, a, a chapter we have on the history of thinking literary travel through the Silk Road. Uh, which, which were all ancient and, and, and medieval era uh, movements of, of, of you know, and, 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 and literary exchanges. Um, so this long durée approach uh, helps us focus on historical processes, theoretical and conceptual shifts over a much longer period than just the history of modernity. So that's really, really and one, of, one of the key features of this book. Uh, naturally, we of course don't ignore the history of, of, of modernity in relation to world literature, but one of the limitations of that history has been to just imagine the literary cultures of the world in terms of um, you know, focusing on the international competition uh, um, uh, uh, through global cap prestige, the capitalist world system, and European diffusionist models. So that history focused more on as if 
the first idea of world literature emerged only in Europe, and then it was it, it kind of diffused uh, itself through the rest of the world, and and so there was a pattern, a historical tracking of first in Europe and then in the rest of the world, while the, a longer historical perspective actually places this particular European moment in the rise of world literature uh, within the context of a much larger history. Another highlight of the volume, th talking of, as a historian, is um, to think that the post-war uh, moment um, also, uh, and the decolonizing moment, also gave rise to this category of literature uh, across both English and comparative and French and Spanish literatures called post-colonial literatures, where there, there was an enormous body of writing uh, from literary scholars uh, from the ex-colonies of ex-colonies of Britain, ex colonies of France and Spain uh, that were flowing into the world literary market. Um, and, and so one could no longer think of English literature as just emerging from Britain or Spanish literature, Hispanic literature just emerging from Spain, and you get the picture. And so, so, so it, the, the categories of Anglophone, Francophone, Hispanophone, these were all global categories of writing, and you had, you had a kind of a mixing of cultures, but also a, a fundamental, uh, I would say, a political shift in thinking about literary production, uh, where, where suddenly that's actually the first global moment in the modern period, if one post-war period, before the rise of the idea of world literature in the 21st century. So one thing this volume also does is take seriously that post-colonial moment, uh, rather than seeing the post-colonial as something different from world literature and actually seeing it in a historical continuum, that there were many, many forces, apart from globalization, apart from our contemporary 21st century geopolitical moments of crisis, it was also within the discipline, the rise of post-colonial literatures, that actually enabled scholars to imagine a, more, a world corpus of writing. Whole literary worlds have come into being due to translational uh, endeavors, and we cannot ignore. We cannot just dismiss translation as um, it, deformation, as corruption, as as because they actually enable modes of literary exchange. So what we do is instead of just focusing on the negative side of translation, we actually have chapters. Uh, and by scholars, major translation experts, who actually demonstrate for us what good translational enterprises that can do and, and the riches that they bring to the fore so that we are not consciously just anxious about translation being secondhand, deforming, and, and so on. One obvious challenge is um, the very idea of thinking the world as a category historically um, in relation to literary production. Because if one wants to be literal about the history of world literature, human beings have, uh, there's all evidence that we've had literary production or literary work uh, achievements uh, that go back to 5,000 years. So how do we write a history, a 5,000 year history of human uh, um, uh, literary uh, and civilizational uh, work. So, so the impossibility of it stares you in the face. Um, so, so uh, uh, historians uh, um, take various kinds of decisions about about how they would go about it. Um, and um, the, the second challenge is um, that not only is there no finite historicity, most, most literary special, specialized literary fields have a certain finite period, have certain key authors, poets, uh, playwrights, a certain corpus of, of works that they focus on. You think of romanticism, British romanticism, for instance. There's a finite period. There are some key figures you focus on. Um, uh, uh, and, and this is, I think, the one field that does not have those kinds of delimitations. So that was that's a real challenge to thinking how we periodize the field. Um, the, the, the second uh, challenge, really, is the sheer 
press and power of the contemporary moment of world literature. It has so overwhelmed debates in the field. What is it to do, uh, what does it mean to do world literature in the global present? So the presentism of, of thinking the field is another challenge. So the, the remote past and the overwhelming force of the present. While the literary historian's uh, main challenge is as actually to navigate uh, the space in between, the, 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 the temporal frame in between. And, and so the way um, uh, I, as the editor, resolved, um, re resolved um, this problem was um, to think, instead of thinking of a seamless history from 5,000 years to our time and a continuous linear history, we, I did away with the idea of a linear history from 5,000 years to our times and focused on some key, very important moments when uh, that were important to thinking literature as a cosmopolitan ideal, as a globe, uh, you know, where, where literary, the idea of literature uh, resonated globally. Uh, and, and we picked some key moments in history, through human history, uh, focused on, on there, there, were some, there are some chapters devoted to, to thinking about these important key, key moments in, in thinking world literature.